are joining with audiences from across the globe to enjoy Harrogate International Festival's series of online events, streamed straight from our home to yours. Sit back, relax, and enjoy an interview with Ben Palmer. We promise you've got the best seats in the house. Welcome everybody to this Harrogate International Festival's Summer Weekend. It's an absolute delight to present this event. My name is Matt Stadler. I'm a broadcaster and a writer and a very special guest I present to you today in the form of Ben Palmer. He's a world-renowned conductor. He's the chief conductor, in fact, at the Deutsche Philharmonie Merck. He's also the founder and artistic director at the Covent Garden Sinfonia. He's a guest conductor all over the place. He's a trumpeter and a composer as well. And he is more than, I think, three quarters of the way through conducting his lifetime's ambition of 107 Haydn symphonies. We've got so much to talk about, so we'll get straight to it. Ben, very well welcome to you. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I'd just like to start, if you would, by you telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, um, uh, I mean, I, I began life, as you said, as a trumpet player. I don't really play anymore except to annoy my wife and my neighbours or to entertain my little boy. Um, although actually, I've been practising more or less every day in lockdown, so um, unlucky then. Um, but uh, yeah, I was a trumpet player. I, I studied uh, music at university in Birmingham, and then I stayed there for a couple of years to do a master's in composition and uh, off that went to the Royal Academy in London to start a PhD as a composer, but very, very quickly thought better of that and gave it all up to concentrate on conducting, which is something that I'd realised whilst I was at university would, would definitely always be something that I wanted to do. And I knew I would be either a conductor who composed or a composer who conducted, but my suspicion had been that if I went to study conducting, I'd never do any composing. And of course, since I gave up composing uh, or in those that in that time when I gave up composing I, I did really just just conduct for the next uh, for the next few years and I, I started composing again I think in 2012 but I, I don't have very much time for it really so it's it's probably sort of 95 percent plus conducting and then a little bit of composing arranging and orchestrating in the gaps now um, but as you said I'm very very lucky to have this chief conductor position in Germany in Darmstadt with this fantastic symphony orchestra there. So I still live in North London, but I'm, uh, I'm out in Germany seven, eight weeks a year, something like that. Uh, and I have my orchestra, Common Garden Symphonia in London, um, and uh, work with lots of lovely, lovely orchestras all over the place, as you were saying. So it's a very, um, uh, a sort of very, very lovely lifestyle doing the things that I want to do, um, which of course throws into even greater relief this really strange time we're going through right at the moment. And we'll come back to this really strange time and to your diary sure. and the effects on your diary. But you mentioned university. You're a clever guy. You graduated, I think, with a first class degree. Do brains and being a conductor always go hand in hand? <laughs> That's a terrifying question. Um, I think there's a... If you, if you asked people on the street uh, or even people in a console or potentially even sometimes people in an orchestra, what, what does a conductor do? Uh, everyone would, you know, do the waving their arms around thing. But actually, when you, when you really get to understand what it is, the raising the arms around bit, of course, is, a, is, a, is an important part of it because it, that's, that's really how you talk to the orchestra when you're not speaking. It's how you transmit your intentions, your thoughts, your feelings through gesture. So that clarity, that, that focus, that um, incisiveness is, is really important. But actually... Really, it's listening and analysing. The thing that informs my movements are the things that I'm hearing. So I, I'm not just trying to show the orchestra how I want them to play. I'm trying to show how the orchestra, uh, trying to trying to show the orchestra how I want them to play in relation to how they are playing. So it is not just about pointing them in a certain direction. It's actually just about guiding them from where they are to that direction. Um, and so there's a lot of listening. I mean, I would say it's really at least 70% listening. Um, and there's also a lot of mental preparation that goes into learning scores. Um, I, I spend a lot of time at my desk with, with scores, you know, open reading, reading them like a book. 
and absorbing, learning, studying, asking myself questions, which I might not answer for a month or two as I sort of get down into the nitty gritty of a piece. Um, and yeah, so that homework is, is, is really, really important so that hopefully when you're standing on the podium in front of the orchestra, you're not wasting their time at all. Uh, I was always taught that a, 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 an orchestra represents thousands and thousands of hours of practice. And the last thing you want to do is to uh, waste anyone's time. My dad always taught me when I was a boy that success is 90% hard work and 10% talent. Do you recognize that? Um, I, I, I think I probably do, quite honestly. Um, I mean, I'm... I mean, all these lovely things that you were uh, saying about me at the, at the beginning of the interview are all things really... I mean, my orchestra, I, I've been running since 2007, but that is something, Covent Garden Symphonia, that that is something that I've essentially organised and fixed and, you know, run all the admin and uh, done all the programming and, you know, everything really myself. Um, and the other sort of successful things that have, that have happened in my career have only really happened in the last, I suppose, four-ish years. Um, and so from 2005 to beginning of 2006, when I, when I left, gave up my PhD at the Academy to, yeah, I suppose about 2016, when I started working for the first time with the orchestra in Germany, which is now my orchestra, uh, I was conducting student orchestras and amateur orchestras and putting together projects of my own. And I sometimes refer to it as my decade in the trenches. Um, and that's not to say that I didn't enjoy it. There were lots of things that I loved about it, but there were times when it could be a little frustrating uh, and it was certainly hard work. And there were times when it was very, very demoralizing. I mean, there were lots of assistant conductor jobs or you know, a few competitions and things that I applied for that I tended not, not, to, not to get very far with. Um, and so it's a great relief to sort of finally have a career where I have some kind of foothold in the industry. And I'm lucky enough that there are a number of orchestras like the Halle, for instance, that brought me to Harrogate for the first time, um, where, where I, I feel I'm, you know, amongst friends and, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to sort of build up relationships with those orchestras because you're not, you're not starting from fresh each time. That's, you know, it, it, meeting a new orchestra is, is extremely exciting, but going back to one you know and love is, is even better, actually. We've done your 10,000 hours, in other words. I mean, the Beatles, they, they spent a lot of time gigging in Germany, didn't they? I mean, the 10,000 hours thing is completely true. My, my wife and I, we just, um, as you can probably see, the sort of rather unattractive um, spot on the ceiling. We've, we've just moved house in February, so we were very lucky just to get in before, before lockdown happened. Um, and um, so we've been hacking at various bits of the house and we've had various things done to it. Um, and my dad is a fantastic DIY expert. He's, he's got a house in France, actually, well, sort of a barn in France, which he's turning into a house. And he's doing it all himself. And so whenever I'm doing anything, I ring him and I say, look, what screw do I need for this? And, you know, why isn't this wall plug this? And, you know, and, and he knows, he knows all the answers because as he, you know, points out, he's done his 10,000 hours. And I think in my years, these sort of formative years as a conductor, you know, from, I suppose, when I was 20, 21, when I started taking my very first steps at university to, yeah, the last sort of three, four, four years where my career started to, um, to take off, I suppose, in a way, uh, you know, I, I mean, there were, there were years where I was, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'd be out every night conducting a different orchestra or choir. Uh, so, you know, how many weeks, weeks that is and how many hours by how many number of years, I'm pro probably not far off that, that 10,000 hours. And, and of course, that's only the hours that I've spent actually on the podium with musicians I've, I've definitely made up the, the, the rest of the 10,000 hours with the, with the study and the preparation and um, you know, thinking about what I would do when I'm actually in front of the musicians. So there's talents and there's hard work, but there's also passion, isn't there? I, I was quite unusual growing up. I mean, we're presumably roughly the same age. And I was quite unusual in that I loved classical music. From a very, very early age, I was always listening to Mozart, Beethoven, mm -hmm. Bach, Schubert, the, the, the big four, as I used to call them and think of them. 
Did you have that passion from the word go as well? I, I think I began playing the trumpet when I was seven. I had a very, and this is, I, we lived in France and we had a very, uh, my first trumpet teacher was a very cool guy called Monsieur Oldman who turned up on a massive motorbike with his trumpets in a sort of leather gig bag. And I just thought this was like the coolest, the, you know, guy arrives on motorbike. Wow. Um, and my dad uh, was a sort of amateur horn player. So we used to play duets a lot. And, you know, there was sort of music in my family, but no one in, in my family is a, is a professional musician. And I enjoyed playing in school orchestras and it was, you know, it was fun, but I always wanted to be a cartoonist. I wanted to be, a, you know, do caricatures and be some, some kind of artist. And then uh, when I was 15, I was given a place in my county youth orchestra. I'd always played in the regional youth orchestra, but I was given a, a much coveted spot in, the, in, in Suffolk Youth Orchestra. And we played Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony at Snape Maltings and the, on the, at the first course. And I think for a night or two after that, I didn't sleep properly. I, it was as if I'd been injected with some kind of drug. And that, that kind of fire has never really left me. It's, it just took hold. And that's basically how I felt about music ever since. I it was felt as if it lit a fire inside me and there's a sort of hunger. So, you know, very often music is the thing I'm sort of wake up thinking about. And it's the thing that, prevents me from sleeping or the thing that I'm dreaming about. Um, and it's quite interesting talking to young musicians about their careers and, you know, uh, sort of youth orchestras I used to conduct and, you know, kids saying to me, oh, I think I'd like to go and, you know, be a trombonist. And I say, well, if you only think, then don't do it. Um, you need not only to want to do it, but actually to have a sort of pathological need to do it um, because there are other people out there who will want it more. Um, and I mean, I think to be any kind of musician you, at, at a sort of reasonable level, you need to be extremely, extremely dedicated. Um, and, you know, music as a genre is not, uh, or ought not to be a competitive thing. Uh, you know, when you're on stage, you're not trying to play, well, you should not, not hopefully should should not be trying to play faster or higher or louder than other people. You should be trying to, you know, play play in the most musical, beautiful way that you can. Um, but of course, there are competitive elements. There are competitions. There are uh, auditions, and you know, I mean, I, I've accepted long ago that there will always be people who are younger than me and more successful than me, and have careers that sort of take off like a rocket, while mine's like you know, slowly clambering up a small Welsh hill or something. Um, but that's fine. You know, I, I, nothing I wrong with nothing wrong with Welsh hills. No, no, um, uh, not at all. I, it's, 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 I, I think, you know, one, one just has to accept that one's own career is going to be different from everyone else's. Um, I mean, I'm quite unusual in a sense in that I never really studied conducting. I, I did a, there was a brilliant summer course at, at Dartington uh, Summer School with a fantastic uh, French conductor called, called Diego Masson, who was, um, I suppose, really the guy who basically, you know, showed, showed me the ropes, if you like. Um, but that was three weeks in, in sort of August 2004, five and six. And I've had odd lessons with people here and there and spent quite a lot of time assisting Roger Norrington, who's a great hero of mine. Um, but, you know, I, I never did a, a sort of conducting course. Uh, and so I think there was, you know, there, for lots of people, if they, if they study at an institution, that institution then perhaps helps with contacts and putting them forward for things. And so in a sense, I've had to make my own way. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of fine with that um, because I, I, I do... Uh, yeah, I, I think the hard work is certainly an element of it, and I'm I'm proud of where I've got to. Um, you, you bring up well. Sir Roger Norrington, and I interviewed him actually a few years ago as part of a piece I was writing for the Spectator. Yeah. So three yeah. prominent conductors were, I think, turning seventy, eighty, and ninety. So Roger was yeah. turning eighty at the time, yeah. and you you so worked Andrew as Davis and, and, and Neville Marin, absolutely yeah. indeed, yeah, and you worked as Sir Roger's assistant for a little while. Now he told me that he spent spends quite a lot of time sitting down 
And it, it's not absolutely necessary to stand up. We have, I suppose, in the collective imagination, this idea of conductors throwing themselves around the place, sweating profusely, hugely charismatic, energetic and, and, and physical. What sort of a conductor are you? Huh. Um, I hope uh, I'm one who is efficient. Uh, that's what I'd always, it's a rather unglamorous word. Um, but in fact, Diego Masson, my teacher at Dartington, uh, was always, he, he, he didn't tend to say very much whilst we were conducting, but he would say, reduce, reduce, do less. You do far too much. The orchestra, eventually they don't watch. Do less. And then when you do something, boom. And, and this, was, this was really, really helpful. And I think I definitely had a few years where I did less, a little bit too much and did not enough. And uh, people used to say that, you know, perhaps it was very clear in the orchestra, but not particularly exciting if you were in the audience. And of course, okay, the audience, one shouldn't really be considering their, their feelings in the matter. They haven't, they haven't paid for the ballet, they've paid to listen. But I think we can't deny that conducting is in some respects a visual art. And I mean, Roger, uh, more than anyone is the master of, I mean, you know, now he sits on a, a, on a spinning office chair on a podium and he will, as I'm doing now, and I'll sort of spin round and point at something that he finds funny. So, you know, if the second violins have a da -da 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 -da, something that he wants to highlight, he'll, he will literally spin da -da 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 -da, and it makes it, you know, sort of very informal and, and very fun, but it's actually also really, you know, it's, it's like when you watch a, a concert, on the proms and they have a fantastic video editor who cuts to the thing that you want to see just as it happens. So you see the trumpet solo and you see the snare drum and you see, Oh, what's that funny percussion instrument? Oh, it's that. Um, and I think it's part of the role of the conductor to actually draw the audience's eyes to, to the things that are happening on stage, uh, you know, depending on the piece, depending on the context of all that, of, of, of course, all those different things. Um, but, my aim really is, is not to worry too much about what I look like, but to try and focus on being clear for the orchestra and being true to the intentions of the composer. Um, as Roger always says, being correct is, is fine. And, you know, I mean, of course, he's very, very famous as being, you know, one of the world's leading exponents of historical performance. And that's something else that I've um, been extremely interested in and really is the way that he and I uh, cross cross paths actually uh, initially, um, but he he always talks about this this fantasy that that you need as well. And I mean, he's completely right. You know, one could uh, perform a Beethoven symphony, and the metronome marks could be exactly correct, and the layout could be correct, and the right forces, and even period instruments, but it could still be boring. You, you know, the conductor is responsible often for bringing that fire, that imagination, that that means that everybody is not only doing exactly the right thing in exactly the right way, but with the same intent. Um, so that's definitely one side of it. One of the other things that I do a lot, which is different from many other conductors, is I conduct a lot of these um, film, with orchestra, film with orchestra screenings. Um, so we were doing Casino Royale in, in Harrogate last, last year. Um, and that's really a completely different art form altogether really because it is all of the things that we've been talking about already whilst trying to keep a 80 piece orchestra perfectly perfectly in time with a film um and it's extremely extremely difficult but i but i love it um so. there's so many jumping off points with what you're saying but let, yeah. let's start <laughs> let's start with with this idea of performing with cinema. What, what do you mm. think? I've never actually been to such a performance. I'd love to go I read about it in researching this interview and what you've done with Harrogate last year. And I just wonder what it's like to be in the audience because I can imagine it would be electrifying and, and it sort of breathes a whole new atmosphere into a movie. It's a really interesting thing, this, um, because the audience for film with orchestra concerts tends to be, quite honestly, the sort of audience that... Uh, classical music programmers dream about. Uh, I mean, I, I did. I conducted the German premiere of um, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, I suppose about 18 months ago, uh, in, in Stuttgart and Nuremberg. And, you know, these two massive concert halls, the Liederhalle and the Meissinghalle, and I don't know, 40, 45% of the audience were, were young people, kids, loads and loads and loads of people who I, I knew hadn't heard an orchestra before. 
Um, and it's it just an amazing, amazing, amazing atmosphere. Um, it's very, very, very difficult to explain to somebody who hasn't experienced it. I think many people don't see the point. You know, what is the point of showing a film on a cinema screen and having a live orchestra there? Uh, you know, how is that different from, from just being in a, in a cinema? But there is, and never fails to be something very, very moving about the film unfolding as it always has done, particularly in these big sort of action, action chase sequences or, you know, things like, I don't know, the, you know, the bike chase in E.T. or, um, you know, the big parkour chase at the beginning of Christina Royale, for instance, you know, where they're jumping off all the cranes and everything. And the music is so intimately synced or should be. Um, and there's something, yeah, as I said, very moving really about seeing this film, which if you think about it, you know, can't adjust. And then seeing in front of you 75, 80 people essentially scrabbling for their lives, racing, fighting to hit a sync point for you so that when James Bond jumps off the thing and lands on the thing, there's a big in the orchestra. And that's extremely, extremely exciting. And I, for me, I think it's something to do with that combination of the, uh, the pre-recorded film, the track of the film, the dialogue, the sound effects in combination with that live human element. And that How does it sense. How does it work technically, though, Ben? Do, do, you, do uh, you switch off the the soundtrack of the movie, or do you play? Yeah, we, we have a we we have a specially adapted version of the film uh, where they strip out the music. So for a sort of modern film, that's not such a difficult thing to do because it's usually just on a track which you turn off. Um, but for an older film, something like Casablanca, they have to essentially go around the soundtrack with a toothbrush and <laughs> scrub out the bits of music around all the the the, the um the dialogue and, and sound effects and sometimes they're not able to do it very well i mean casablanca's quite a good example of that so there are still remnants of the original soundtrack there on the track so if you were to just play the film without the orchestra you hear while someone is talking and then when they stop talking it's silent and then when someone starts talking, they go, rah, 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 underneath. Um, so in those performances, you have to be absolutely right. Otherwise, it sort of sounds as if it's going through a car wash. Um, the te- so there's, there's that element. And I mean, of course, that means that not every film is available. Only the films which have been adapted for live orchestra performance are available to, to be done in that way. Uh, there's a huge job to be done in adapting the printed music because very often... I mean, for instance, if you think of a film like uh, Home Alone, which actually was the first of the, the John Williams films that was, that was adapted for live performance. Um, there's the, if you know the film, the, 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 uh, when, when they're in the, in the church, Kevin's in the church and the choir is singing, and then he suddenly realises he has to rush, rush home and set the trap uh, to catch the bad guys. Um, and the choir is singing this uh, Carol of the Bells, you know, bim, bobby, bum, bim, bobby, bum. and then suddenly you get the clock chiming, and then there's this amazing, amazing cue called uh, s- Setting the Trap, where he runs home and sets all the, you know, all, all the booby traps for the, for the bad guys. And I imagine what they did when they were recording the soundtrack was they recorded the choir, <laughs> and then they added the bell, <laughs> and then they recorded the setting the trap piece of music and combined them all and you know faded one out and mixed them together so it's and when we do that live the choir is singing live and the choir you can see on the screen you can see the their mouths moving so it has to be absolutely perfectly in the right place the bell is on the track um and there's a tempo relationship between the bell the choir and the cue that starts and it's extremely extremely complicated so i mean really talk about homework uh, for those films, so for the more recent films, I have a, a monitor in front of me that has a, uh, a system that we call punches and streamers. If anyone's ever played Guitar Hero, it's a little bit like a sort of posh version of that. Uh, the a sort of uh, line will come across the screen, and when it hits the edge, there's a little uh, flash in the middle, uh, which is called a punch, and this is called a streamer. Uh, this system was invented by Alfred Newman, who wrote the... Um, 20th Century Fox fanfare that we all know. And uh, originally, they, they actually scraped a line on the actual film and punched a hole in it, which gave the impression of this line moving across the screen and then a flash. Um, and of course, it's all done digitally now, 
Uh, some films have that and then also have a click track, which either I will have or I and some other members of the orchestra will have. And then there are other films like Casablanca we talked about or Psycho, where there's a, a very old school analog clock that sort of goes around and I have to just sync up the music with things that happen on screen according to timings. Uh, and then I've conducted lots of silent films like Charlie Chaplin films where there's absolutely no technology at all. And I take all my cues from things that happen in the film. And that is seriously hard. That's like walking a, a tightrope for 90 minutes. At the moment, I'm learning uh, Modern Times, um, which is famous for being the most difficult silent film to conduct, which is, I suppose, the most one of the reasons why I wanted to do it. It has music by Chaplin himself. And uh, there's this whole production line thing where he's uh, you know, doing a spanner. And every time he does that, there's a, there's a cue for it in the orchestra. It's astonishing. Incredible. So it, it, very complicated. And then the huge need, for, as you say, for precision. Lots of different relationships going on at the same time. And talking about relationships and multi-layers, just to dig down a bit more into the nuts and bolts of what it is to be a conductor, because you've got a relationship with the with the orchestra obviously and as you said with the composer but you've also got a relationship when you're live with an audience and you've got your back to us for the vast majority of it and yet a, an audience can really come to love a, a conductor i mean particularly perhaps the last night of the proms or if they, if there's a virtuoso a, a first time con conductor the audience can get incredibly involved and that must be massively part of the excitement. Are you aware of the audience? Are you aware of the atmosphere, even though it's behind you a lot of it? Much, much more than you would or could possibly imagine. Uh, I feel very often, and I mean, maybe I'm projecting this, but sometimes I feel as if I know what an audience is feeling or thinking very occasionally um you can actually elicit a kind of gasp from an audience um you know with a, a sudden um you know if there's something shocking in what you're doing if for instance a, a tempo is very different from i mean this is something roger is famous for um you know i think think of a piece uh, you know schubert nine um and you know people are used to and roger's has been I think quite correctly, that's the, that's the speed I take. But, you know, when that movement starts up at that speed, you can hear, you, you can actually hear that. You can sense that sense of, oh, oh, oh this is interesting. This is new. Um, and one of the things that's very difficult to sort of explain, if you're playing something like a Mahler symphony, there is an extent to which the audience carries the orchestra. Um, if you think of something like, Mahler 7 I was doing with my with my German orchestra a year and a half ago um, in Wiesbaden and it's an incredibly long piece it's exhausting to play and this last movement's sort of 18 19 minutes long or longer I don't know you know really vast 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 thing um, and it's really really difficult but somehow having 12 1400 people there in the audience makes it impossible for things to go wrong they just somehow just it's and it's it's uh, there'd probably be a very interesting diagram about which way concentration and energy and awareness flows I, I i don't know because actually i'm not really aware of the audience when i'm conducting as in consciously aware and yet i sort of know that they're there it's 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 all getting very philosophical and um unhelpful but, um, because as an audience member, one, I suppose one of the exciting things about there is not just being part of a collective experience that so many of us are, are missing right now. I mean, Zoom is absolutely. okay, and it's, 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 a, it's a decent substitute, but it's by no means, as you know, the, the same thing. But I, I suppose another thing about being at a live concert which differentiates it from recording, and I don't know whether you experience this as well as a conductor, is that something could go wrong or something could go right. Something could go spectacularly wrong or something could go amazingly right. It's that sort of not knowing that is part of it, isn't it? I, I think absolutely. And um, I mean, one of, the, uh, one of the things I was thrilled about when I did my first couple of concerts with, as I was saying, what is now my, now my orchestra in Germany, the, the reviewer, uh, I think the second concert I did, we did... Um, uh, we did Brahm, Brahms 4 and Sibelius 2 together in the same concert, which is slightly wacky, but was, was, a, was an amazing program. Was, they, they wanted to do Brahms and I wanted to do Sibelius and we couldn't quite decide what to do in the first half, so we decided to do them both. It was a rather, it was a rather fun thing. Um, and I pushed them to play 
so quietly that um because we also did the Sibelius Val Streets doesn't open it and then Brahms first Hungarian dance. And I think in the Sibelius Val Streets the, the the reviewer said something about you know pushing pushing the orchestra right to the limit of audibility. And it's that sort of thing, you know, when you can get an audience and actually get them quiet enough to make something that's so, so quiet that they're not almost quite sure if they can hear it. Um, and as you say, th- there's a risk in that, you know, will it, will it work? Will, uh, and and, and I, I really like that element of danger about live performance. And, and I enjoy making recordings. And it's in a, in, in a way making recordings is fun because you can take risks because you can have another go, but you can never quite recreate that same feeling that you do if you've got 2,000 people there listening. So, and there's not quite know. the same integrity as well if you, if you keep going to pa- back to, to patch something up, I imagine. Uh, integrity and recording are uh, two words that don't sit very comfortably together. Uh, um, it's very, very difficult now making recordings because, uh, I mean we talked about Neville Mariner, he and Carrie Ann basically spent their careers making quote unquote, perfect recordings. That's not to say they're ideal recordings, but they are perfect. Um, there are very, very few, if any split notes or things that are not completely in tune or together, um, because they were both conductors who famously insisted on, uh, lots and lots and lots of time, uh, and, very, very good pay for their musicians. I mean, Mariner especially. I, I believe that the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields were paid film rates for recording classical uh, albums, which is why they were able to get such astonishing players and have lots of time. Because, of course, you know, CD boom and everybody was, was buying everything. Um, and, yeah, so making a, making a CD, you think, okay, we can take a risk, but actually it's only going to work if we can make it sound good. Um, I mean, there are many, many recordings now that are theoretically live, but are actually, you know, it says live, recorded live in concert. But if you look at it, it'll actually say recorded on the 10th, 11th, 12th in London, and the 17th in Paris, and the 19th in Berlin, or something. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the sound engineer's job to stitch all of that together to make something that is as perfect as possible. And, and, and we often have debates when we're listening to the edit of a CD, do we keep this take that is utterly beautiful and has this just moment that makes you want to cry, but, you know, a few moments before there's a little twang or somebody coughs or you can hear a car outside or, you know, there's a horn split or whatever, or do you go with the one which is techni- technically perfect but doesn't move you? I mean, I remember, remember always talking to Roger about when he was recording the Beethoven symphonies with the London classical players um, and in the big climax of the first movement of Beethoven two, um, and there's this sort of amazing moment with this chain of suspensions between the horn, horns and horns and trumpets, uh, and sort of great clash. And, and the second trumpet is a bit out of tune, but it just makes me weep. It just makes me cry because it's it, it's like a sort of cry of anguish. And I, I was saying to Roger that was my favourite thing of uh, you know my favourite bar of anything that he'd ever recorded, and he said it was his son's favourite bar as well. And that they were listening to it and deciding, and they 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 just couldn't let it go because it was it wasn't perfect, but it was exactly conveyed what they'd been trying to express. Well, you hear so many old recordings, don't you? Certainly, some of the the, the real masters. I'm thinking of pianists, just for example, where there are yeah. loads of mistakes, loads of technical errors. Yeah. But in a way, it's better for it because it's so raw and, it, and it's so passionate. And you, you spoke a little earlier about competitions. And I wonder how we should be judging music these days, because there's been such an emphasis in recent years on perfection, on technique, and yet give me interpretation over technique any day. How do you feel about it? It's funny, actually. I would, I would slightly argue with you on the, the sort of perfection and technique thing and say that it is my, my impression that it has become about personality now um and there was no better example of that really than i think it was a few years ago 40 years of the bbc young musician of the year and they showed you um you know some some clips from from the first the first couple of years 
of the series and it was all these incredibly awkward kids with you know massive glasses um all being interviewed and they didn't they couldn't string two words together you know it was all extremely oh yes no very happy to be here i believe someone asked the oboist uh, nicholas daniel who his greatest inspiration was and he said well me i suppose really you know just absolutely amazing things um but they played divinely you know and they looked like i mean really like children on stage they looked innocent unworldly no clue how to promote themselves pr you know no twitter instagram any of this kind of stuff um he says as a great social media user but um and now and this is not to um talk down to any of the fantastic people who are on young musician year all of whom i'm in awe of and who are wonderful but there is particularly from the program makers side a great focus on the backstory a great focus on you know so-and-so's grandmother died great focus on oh didn't they perform amazingly but, I, 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 but sorry you know well, because they were wearing you know silver silver don't they have lots of personality because they're wearing silver trousers or and actually i would much rather to answer your question that really people listened with their ears rather than with their eyes and i think i think it is fundamentally a big problem that we have in classical music at the moment uh is that it's not a strict meritocracy um it's also important to say that there's a huge huge amount of work to be done with uh for instance making it a level playing field for bane musicians for female conductors it's something that's we're all very very aware of at the moment um and there is more that we could all be doing and you know we all do what we can to sort of try and help uh things but i don't think that um advancing the careers of young musicians because they are or any musicians because they throw themselves around on stage rather than because they play divinely is necessarily helpful i'd argue back just to, su to suggest this of, of course i think there's a huge emphasis on personality today but i'm talking about the difference between getting things technically absolutely right and interpretation and interpretation is different from whether you've got an interesting backstory. So in the past, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago, as I say, you could get, you, you could get away if you're, if you're a great interpreter of music, you could get away with making technical mistakes, getting some notes out of place. Today, I think it is assumed that everything has to be in place at the very least. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, I think there is, a, there is an extent to which the standards just improve. I mean, if you compare... I mean, you know, I, I used to work quite often with the, with the Symphony Orchestra of the Royal College of Music. I used to go in there and prepare the orchestra for people like Roger or Bernard Heitink or Jack Van Steen, people, people like that coming in to um, do a project and I'd go in and take the preparatory rehearsals. And I'd sometimes go and watch the, watch the concerts or watch the live stream or watch their, you know, watch their first rehearsals. And with your eyes closed, you would sometimes be hard pressed to know that it wasn't an extremely good professional orchestra because they could do it or they could play all the notes. And you go back to, let's say, a recording of the RPO or the LSO from their earliest recordings, so, you know, 20s, 30s, that kind of thing. And as you say, there are crap notes, things are out of tune, very, you know, things are not together. Life just moves on. And I mean, also recording technology moves on. So at that time, a, a recording really was literally a record. And I mean, I believe one of the conductors, I can never remember who it is, uh, went to listen to a take and the, a horn splits had been edited out and he said, ah, oh, it's a shrindle, shrindle, um, you know, because he felt it wasn't honest. And as I said to you, you know, recording now is a process that we all love, really, but it's not, it's not an honest representation, really, of, of what's happening because we have the opportunity to correct things and go back and do them again. Um, uh, I'm not a fan of the word interpretation. I don't like it. I don't think it's something that's helpful to our profession uh, or to our industry or to the art form in, in general. I, I, and I suppose this goes back a little really to what I was saying about this sort of obsession with personality and backstory and all this kind of thing. Um, I, I feel, you know, as a conductor, my first responsibility, I suppose, is to the orchestra and my second, third and fourth responsibilities are to the composer. Um, and I would hope that all of the decisions that I take 
are justifiable by things that I can point out to you in a score. So if, if you said to me, Ben, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? I would be able to say to you, well, because there's this and if you, you know, uh, rather than this idea that I am bringing an interpretation to a piece that exists and making it my own. I mean, of course I do do that, but I do it from a perspective of trying to realize what I think is actually there in, there in the music. And but this is fascinating, Ben, because I mean, and I wonder whether you're influenced in part in this by hip and you mentioned it earlier, historically. 100% by Roger. Form form, yeah, yeah. In, indeed. But surely what, what makes it so wonderful to go and listen to your performance of a Haydn symphony, but then to go and listen to another great con conductor's performance of a Haydn symphony is that the composer leaves enough space there in a wonderful, in a, in a really big, important, great piece of music, the composer leaves enough space there for interpretation, for you to bring n not your ego to it, but what you see in it and what you hear in it. So if, there's a, if a, a, I will get something very different from a great work of literature when I read it to what you might get from it. I think one of the curses, if you like, of being a conductor, um, and I've spoken with colleagues about this, um, about you know when we're sort of learning a piece of music, and there's this great debate uh, about whether conductors listen to other conductors' recordings or not, because uh, you know there's sh should one sit there with with the score as a as a you know the piece of art as a thing and get all the information that you you need just from that score, or does the performing tradition of a piece somehow form a part of the piece of music itself uh there's a school of thought which says you'd be crazy not to listen to the greatest musical minds of the last 100 years 110 years listen to their versions listen to their thoughts listen to their ideas just as we might read mozart's letters you know it's helpful to listen to adrian bolt's recordings of elgar or elgar's recordings of elgar um but, you know, is it helpful to listen to Baron Boyne's recordings of Elgar? Um, every, every musician will have their own uh, view on that. For me, there is a great frustration in, uh, let's say, occasionally turning up to, well, sometimes one works with a soloist who does all the usual things in all the usual places, which is to say there are, things in a certain piece that are are often done you know you slow down here you do this bit on the g string you do this you know and very often we can trace these traditions back to a certain performer someone who did them for the first time or somebody who made an edition of a piece you know a Mendelssohn violin concerto and a famous violinist said well i play it like this and that was published and then all the teachers took that edition and took them to their students and it somehow becomes an accepted part of the piece. Um, and there's an amazing violinist with him I've never worked called Pekka Kozisto, who played the Tchaikovsky Concerto uh, at the proms a few years ago. And people were just sort of going, why is this, why is this, why is this crazy piece? Because he just played what Tchaikovsky wrote. And I, I remember I was driving back from, um, back from the Southwest, I think. And I was sitting there in the car and I was so excited because I, it, this is how I'd heard the piece in my head, but had never, ever heard it played uh, like this before. And it was astonishing. I mean, utterly breathtakingly, you know, and everyone said, oh, his interpretation. But of course, my feeling was that he didn't really interpret anything. He just played what was written. And of course, the composer is nearly always right. Um, and I think that's something that we ought to remember. I mean, you mentioned Haydn symphonies. It's something I've immerse myself in quite a lot but um, there is this um, it's, it's sort of almost a running joke that uh, in the second movement of Haydn symphonies we it, it is often done not to play the repeat you know it's usually a, a sort of two-part structure and the first bit's repeated and the second bit's repeated sometimes you do the first repeat and not the second one because it's just too boring that's what everybody says but as Roger would say if you get the right speed by the time you reach the double bar I'm yeah, I'd quite like to go back and hear that again. Thanks very much. Um, but that usually means that the speed is two, at least two or three times faster than what the sort of accepted norm is. I mean, if you take the Haydn 101, the clock symphony, and someone decided it sounded like a ticking metronome, and so everybody suddenly decided that it ought to go at 
uh, you know, something equal 60 so that it sounds like a clock. But of course, you know, Haydn wouldn't have recognized that as, at all as a thing. Um, and he'd have played it much, 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 much faster. It's, it's, it's just, it's a very funny, um, it's a very funny thing how music gets handed down to us. Um, and I think there's an inherent danger with so much music available to us online, you know, recordings we can get anywhere on YouTube, on Spotify, anything like that. And uh, it's not off, it's, let's say it's not all musicians who go to the notes first rather than to what their teacher told them to do or what a recording by their favourite artist does. Just while we're talking about traditions and, and handing down ways of, do, of doing things, you're, in a sense, as you described earlier, a, a musical orphan. I mean, you don't come from a very strong musical background, so you're forging your own way in the world to an extent. I mean, my, my grandfather was a concert pianist. He, he premiered the Weber and Variations in 1930s Berlin or Vienna, I forget which. Mm -hmm. And his cousin, and therefore also a relative of mine, was Anton Dorati, the great conductor. My great, 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 the Haydn symphonies. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. And my great, great, great uncle on my grandmother's side was Johann Strauss. Although, although not by blood, that he composed the Blue Danube, and yet wasted on me because I'm, I'm not a <laughs> I'm not a classical musician myself. A, I just wonder. I, I wonder not having that sort of background has that influenced you? Does it sort of, in a way, freed you up that you can come at things afresh, mentally, psychologically? I, I wouldn't go anything like that deep with it. Uh, I, I maintain that the reason I am musical is because. Uh, my mum loved, um, you know, things like Oliver and the Sound of Music and Mary Poppins. And we had the tapes and we used to listen to them on long car journeys and sing them. And I knew every word. Uh, and, you know, if you start singing when you're a kid and maybe start playing a musical instrument. I mean, no, as I said, no one in my family is a professional musician, but my dad still sings. Uh, he used to play the horn a lot. Uh, my aunt played the cello. Uh, my uncle was a, always a fantastic pianist uh, and used to play the trumpet. I learned using his instrument until I was, well, until I was 15. Um, and so there, there was always music in my family, but nobody just did it as a job, really. Um, and so, I, you know, I, it, it felt like a very, felt like a very normal thing to be doing. Uh, but I suppose actually, in a way, the, the slightly abnormal thing was to decide that I was going to make it my career. Um, yeah. Growing up, and I, I, I listened to the, the, Mozart, the complete Mozart piano sonata cycle by Mitsuko Shida, a wonderful mm. pianist. I bumped into her coming out of a concert at the Wigmore Hall a few years ago, and I'm probably misremembering what she said, but I asked her whether she would do another Mozart cycle. And she said, I think, and I, I, as I say, maybe misquoting her, but I, th I think she said she didn't need to because she, it, it was all in there. It was all in her head. I mean, you love Haydn symphonies. Are, are they all inside you already? Uh, it's a very interesting one. I, I, I sort of took up with this crazy idea of wanting to conduct all the Haydn symphonies in, I think, 2011 when I finished my Beethoven cycle with, with my Comte Grand Symphonia. Um, we, we had played all of the symphonies between 2007 and 2011. And I think for almost all of them, it was my first time conducting those pieces. And so I had this amazing experience of opening a Beethoven symphony score for the first time and getting to learn the piece and preparing it and performing it. And I was then, once we'd done all nine, obviously extremely happy that we'd sort of completed the set as it were, but also rather sad that I would never have the experience of opening a Beethoven symphony score for the first time. And I'd started to do a few Haydn symphonies and found them amazing and, and brilliant and moving and hilarious and, and everything in between. And yeah, so start, started trying to program, program them. And I, I think the year later put it in my biography that it was my ambition. And, and then people started rather helpfully chucking them at me, which was great. Um, I can remember all of the ones that I've conducted, as long as I have a score in front of me, as soon as I have the score in front of me and I can go, oh yeah, it's this one. I'm really bad at, with, with a few exceptions, I'm really bad at thinking of a number and being able to remember which symphony it is because there are just, I mean, I've conducted 85 of them now. Um, and of course there are some I know really, really well that I've conducted from memory and conducted lots of times. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't have a sort of... Um, encyclopedic brain that I can go, 
well, you know, think of a number and whistle, whistle you all the themes from it. Um, but I have to say, I find them very, very easy to learn and assimilate. And I mean, I, I could quite happily, if you gave me one I haven't conducted, you know, learn it and be happy to take a rehearsal with it in less than an hour because it's like a language now. And of course, one could go deeper into it, but just as a sort of needing to prepare it quickly and, and take a rehearsal for it, you know, I'd be very, very happy with an hour just because I know the style so intimately now. It's extraordinary. But let's take a composer that perhaps that you know a little less well or a work that you know less well. I mean, I, I, I don't know, take Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, just as an example. And you're coming at it professionally for the first time. How long will you spend with that script? You talk about the hours you put in before you, yeah. before you meet the orchestra. I mean, actually, Beethoven is not a great example because I'm doing it again in January and I've done it lots of times and it's actually it's one I conduct from memory I think usually so I, I know that one very well but um, I mean Schubert 9 for instance is a piece I conducted it once I think and I've conducted it a couple of times but the last time was actually fun enough was in 2015 there was I was at the Royal College and it was for Roger I was preparing the orchestra for him and then he had to have an operation on his eye so I came out of a rehearsal to a text from him saying Good luck. You're on for this week. Love, Rog. Brilliant. Um, um, and, How did you also, feel at that moment? Uh, worried for him, but also just sort of elated, really. Um, you know, I mean, it was an enormous, you know, there was, as far as he was concerned, there was no question about whether anybody else should be invited to take over the concert. I think, you know, uh, yeah. And, and, and it was live streamed. It was live streamed and I, and I had text message. It was like the most 21st century thing to ever happen from Roger Norrington. He, he basically live tweeted. He sort of live texted the whole thing to me. So I, I, we did this uh, um, uh, Haydn, Haydn La Reine in the first half. Uh, and I, I came back to like a couple of text messages from him in the interval. Um, and then uh, Schubert Nine in the second half. And, and I had a couple of messages from him. Fantastic. Brilliant. He's, you know, he's, he was just, he was so lovely about it. Um, uh, and yeah, so no, I was, I was very proud that he put his trust in me to, to do that for him. And uh, yeah, it was, I was, I felt very lucky to be, to be given the chance. Um, but anyway, so that was a piece that the, the Sugar Man that I haven't conducted in that time. So it's five years. Uh, I have the score on a, on a shelf just behind me. So it's on my sort of to do shelf. Um, and I'm, it's long enough ago that I'm essentially starting again. Um, and I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sitting there with the score. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll probably spend a few hours on it every couple of weeks for between now and the concert. And, 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 you, as we and get you closer can to hear me, it. You can hear it in your ear, can you, just by looking at the page? Yeah. I mean, in the same way that you can look at a book and read the words without reading that loud and imagine them in your head, I can do that with an orchestral score. And of course, if it's a really complicated score um, and you know, there are lots of different layers and lines, it's more complicated and I can't do it very fluently. One needs to sort of sit there and work it out to imagine it. Um, but that is, I mean, I'm always surprised by this question uh, people ask, oh, you know, how do, how do you learn a score? Do you sit at the piano? And I say, I don't really play the piano actually very well. And they say, you don't play the piano. Well, how, how do you learn the scores? And I say, well, I just read them like a book. And, you know, that is really a fundamental skill for a conductor to be able to look at a piece of music and imagine how it sounds. Because if you need a piano to actually imagine a chord, how can you hear a chord that's, you know, an orchestra's playing and, and identify which note is wrong? Um, it's it's a really fundamental skill um and i mean i i think it probably comes from um being a composer as well and and sitting sitting in orchestras and following miniature scores and and learning how the orchestra is put together really and we're, we're running out of time ben and mm -hmm. I, we i, I want to finish as we might have started in fact by talking about the current crisis It's the elephant yeah. in the musical room it's the elephant in For all sure. of our rooms but before we do that just finally on on performance Talk to us a little bit about what, it, what it's like in terms of the chemistry between you and the orchestra, between you and the players. Does, it, does each orchestra have a, a, a different lead character? Is it the lead violinist? Do they have a spokesman or, or, or woman? And how do you relate to them? How do you, in other words, do you get the best out of the people that you're working so intimately with? 
uh, every every orchestra is different. Uh, every project with every orchestra is different. Uh, and so there is no one single answer to that, sadly. Uh, it, would be, it would be lovely if there was a sort of secret formula that one could uh, unlock. Um, it's very, very nice to go back to an orchestra that one knows. So, um, you know, for instance, the Halle, who we were saying, you know, did this concert in Harrogate. That was, I think, the second time I'd worked with them. Uh, and I've done maybe four, four or so projects with them now. And I'm going, going back, hopefully, uh, in October to do Beethoven 7 and uh, the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. Um, and I just feel very comfortable with them. I was sort of a little bit nervous the first time because you know, it's the Halle. Uh, and I'd met them a long time ago in an audition for their assistant conductor job, which I didn't get because um, uh, they gave it to someone who was brilliant and a decade younger than me, um, who's a great friend and colleague of mine. So, um, uh, but yeah, the, the first time I was sort of apprehensive, but you find out that it works and they like you enough to, uh, you know, foolishly invite you back and, and you build on that. And of course, not all the same players who are playing in the first concert are all playing in the second concert. The vast majority uh, are, of course, but not all of them. Um, and so the, the, the little details of the chemistry can feel quite different from, from project to project. And each time you meet a new orchestra, those first few moments where you're conducting, you're working out, you know, Actually, what does it sound like? Crucially, where do they play in relation to your beat? For instance, in Germany, orchestras play rather later. So you give a one and the sound arrives later than it does in the UK. Um, and so there's, there's just, it, it, it's, like a, it's like a sort of diagnostic service. Your brain is listening to everything, absorbing everything, saying, okay, so the trumpets are really, really bright here. Uh, okay, or the trombones maybe play a little late, or okay, the double basses sound really clean. That's great, but the cellos are sort of quite woody. How am I going to match? How am I going to marry those two things together? Or you know, is there a place where I can exploit that? It, it's just they're not things that are consciously going through your head. Your brain's just processing everything. You're like a painter um, in a way, aren't you? Yeah, um, I, I would think. Or a chef, the, a chef with ingredients. The chef, the chef analogy is really useful. Uh, concerts and dinner parties are really fairly fairly alike you know we spend a lot of time uh, planning a recipe before we get into the kitchen the kitchen is like the rehearsals and, you know you spend a lot of time chopping things and getting everything absolutely the same uh, the same the same size and the same shape uh, and um, you know it might be a recipe that everyone knows but you know you sort of flavor the sauce slightly differently from other people or go back to an old-fashioned recipe or whatever it is. Um, it's a really good analogy. And then, of course, hopefully guests turn up. Um, so let's talk about COVID-19. Looking at your diary earlier, so many events, of course, so many concerts have, have been cancelled. You've been getting up to a lot of DIY. I imagine you've been spending your time very creatively. How have you spent your time musically? How upsetting has it been? When do you think you might be able to get back on the road? And just yeah. a word or two about the absolute crisis that is facing the creative industries and how classical music in particular is fitting into that gloomy scenario at the moment. I, I think like many of my friends and colleagues spent the first moments of this thing uh, essentially in denial. You know, I had a concert in Zurich that was cancelled and I said, oh, it's OK, I'm, I'm off to Germany next week things aren't so bad there. And the day before I was due to fly, it was cancelled. And then it was sort of like dominoes gradually, everything in my diary from March through April, uh, just just went one by one. Just as luck would have it, I'd had a very, very quiet February. Uh, and March and April were, I mean, the sort of bumper months of my year. And so financially, of course, you can extrapolate from that that um financially it's not a great it's not a great thing to happen if all your concerts suddenly disappear um sadly i'm not in line to receive any government uh, help we're very lucky that my wife has a job in the bbc symphony orchestra so she has her salary from the bbc which is fantastic um but it seems right uh, fairly difficult to swallow that like everybody else i mean i'm self-employed but I do my tax return very fairly and diligently every year. And 
uh, it seems amazing that um, you know people are getting, being given uh, ten pounds to eat in restaurants uh, when you know the government wouldn't uh, give three pounds a day for school children to have ski- free school meals, and that people who have, I mean, you know, essentially there's a there's a big chunk. Uh, of of musicians, self-employed musicians, and people who are encouraged to be limited company uh, directors, uh, who have essentially been been hung out to dry with with no support. I'm in a much more privileged position uh, than many of my friends and colleagues, uh, but it's really really tough. I think our industry is going to be suffering from this for a really long time. As things stand, um, well, I had an email today saying a concert with with Cobb Gun Symphonia in I think the the end of September at South Bank Centre in London have has been cancelled. They've they've cancelled that. Uh, I'm talking to my orchestra in Germany. We're hoping we have a concert. I think on the first week of September, and we're hoping that can take place uh, with uh, Mendelssohn Violin, Violin Concerto staying as Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, but Bruckner Seven, which has uh, a lot of horns and Wagner tubers and trombones in it, becoming Beethoven One, which has a smaller orchestra. And then in November, we were due to be doing Mahler Six, and there would probably be about 103, 105 people on stage. And that's being changed, we think, probably to a chamber version of Mahler One for, well, it's 20 something players. Um, because the theatres where we perform currently have limitations about the number of people who uh, are permitted on stage and are permitted in the audience. So it's a really, really difficult time. I think probably in, in Germany and in continental Europe, they're dealing with it rather better, both in terms of how they're supporting the arts and how they're making it possible for the arts to, to come back to some kind of normality. Uh, and I really fear for uh, the orchestras and venues and promoters with whom I work in the UK um, because uh, I, I don't really think anything or enough is, is being done to help them. Huge uncertainty. How does that make you feel psychologically, just as a, a human being, but also, of course, as a performer? I mean, I, for the first month and a half of lockdown, I kept getting these mad rushes of adrenaline as if I'd suddenly drunk 17 cups of coffee in one go. And I realized, I think, probably that that was all the adrenaline that I normally, you know, sort of gets unleashed when I'm on stage realizing that it didn't have an outlet and my body just going, yep, yeah, okay, here's some adrenaline, uh, have fun with that. And, you know, it, it is like mourning for, 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 for a loved one. And I mean, of course, there are people who, who really are mourning for loved ones, which, which is much worse than, you know, worrying about one's career. But, um, you know, there's the denial, there's the anger, there's the frustration. I'm, you know, as we all are terribly upset about things that I've had in my diary and been longing to do and looking forward to. I mean, the, the project in March that was cancelled the day before I flew out was um, Strauss's Ein Heldenleben, which I've been learning for a year. You know, I've got this huge score, which, and, and I've been spending months and months and months and months and months learning it, and it just vanished. Um, and I, I, of course, there's a... The, the first priority has to be the safety of everybody. But I think probably when we look back on this, um, we'll realize that there's a, there's a great emotional toll. And, a, you know, quite apart from the sort of financial toll as well, economic toll, but a great emotional toll that, that won't be great for the, the, the mental health of, of, of our world. How have you coped with it creatively? Have you, have you been able to put your time to good use beyond doing the house up? Beyond doing the house up, um, well, actually, my wife, uh, lucky for luckily for us all, uh, who's, who's much better at painting than I am, has has been doing lots of lots of that. <coughs> and um, uh, I've actually, funny, I've been doing the thing which we we started the interview talking about, which is I've been doing lots of composing and arranging. Um, I was lucky enough to be given a, a commission for an orchestral piece uh, for a concert, which is in. 2022 which i'm conducting and they very kindly commissioned a, a sort of a short piece to go at the beginning of that concert um so 2022 we hope that will go ahead right um so i've been working on that i've been doing a few arrangements for various promoters that i work with 
uh, I've also been asked by um, so Film 4 and the Royal Albert Hall asked me to do a, one of these um, split screen videos of uh, Danny Boy with Grindthorpe Colliery Band. We were supposed to be doing a screening of Brassed Off live in the Royal Albert Hall in the middle of April. Of course, that was cancelled. So instead, Film 4 showed the film and we did this sort of little lockdown recording. Uh, I did a Another one of those recordings with my German orchestra uh, of the, uh, the the Prelude Act Three of Lohengrin by Wagner, and actually a um, <coughs> excuse me, um, actually the my my orchestra in London was commissioned to um, produce a, a lockdown recording of uh, a Ravel um, Jewish prayer for the by the family of an elderly Jewish lady who died in New York back in January and her family wanted to put on a, memori a memorial concert but weren't able to do so because of the coronavirus situation. So they commissioned a film with lots of different artistic responses from around the world from you know, responding to themes of isolation. Well, we have seen imagination at work, haven't we? We've seen people being creative in music, but <laughs> it's essentially, and just very briefly, Ben, do, do you think... It, is impossible for classical music, for the classical music world to survive unless we get back to some sort of normality. Just briefly, and then I want to finish on an upbeat note. Well, this may be um, upbeat. Well, <laughs> um, my suspicion is that the classical music world will be changed forever by this. It may not necessarily be changed in the things that we see on stage. <clears throat> Although, of course, in the short term, we may see 15 people on stage rather than 115 people on stage. Um, Sorry about this. <coughs> I thought it's better to get one cough out of the way and they can chop it out. <clears throat> 115 people on stage. I think there will be a lot of changes behind the scenes, perhaps with agencies, the way that the business works, um, and perhaps the way venues are run, funding models, who knows. As things stand, I don't think it's going to be a very good thing. Uh, uh, but maybe it will make us look at how classical music is, is, is run and we can try and keep the things that we love and change some of the things that we love a little less. Um, Just to finish then on, on an upbeat note, Ben, because I know this is, I mean, this is, we're talking trauma here. I mean, I've found this whole experience incredibly absolutely. difficult for all sorts of different reasons. And I host lots of live events under normal circumstances. I'd be interviewing you on stage and it's a, it's a massive, massive buzz to be in front of an audience, to interact not just with the person you're interviewing, but also with, with the people in the audience. I love it. I, I mean, it's probably the very best thing I, I do. It's intoxicating and I miss it and I want it to come back when, when it's safe. Just in your own words, explain what it is like to be on stage. When everything's going well, with you, you're with, with one of your fantastic orchestras, you've got a wonderful audience, you're in an, you're in an amazing venue, it's a, it's a Haydn symphony. Just in, in, in 30 seconds, tell us why you love that so much. Uh, uh, my second concert, the chief conductor of my orchestra in Germany, we were playing Mendelssohn V, which was one of my most favourite symphonies, the Reformation Symphony. And after the concert, uh, our principal horn, Juliana, came up to me and she said, did you know that for some of that, we were all flying? And I said, yeah, I totally felt it. And it doesn't always happen, but when it happens, it's indescribable. It is like time stops or it goes quickly or it goes slowly. It's, you don't, you know, you're not playing the notes. I'm not conducting. We're just flying. And it's actually, it's the audience that, that, keeps the whole thing in the air somehow that that, that um yeah and it's and it's an impossible feeling to describe really but it is the most thrilling thing that i've ever experienced is being on stage with musicians i love uh conducting music i love with an audience that loves the orchestra and loves the music it's an indescribable feeling it's an enormous privilege uh because you know there is just one of me um and it's something i'm very very grateful for and I think I've never taken my work for granted anyway, but I know that the first moment I'm allowed to stand on a stage with some musicians, even just in the first rehearsal, um, I'm sure that I will play through the piece and then maybe just call for a coffee break so I can go and sit in a corner and have a quiet week to myself because I miss it so, 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 so much. Ben Palmer, it's, it's a, a great thrill and a privilege to speak to you and to hear someone speak so passionately about their work. And I, 
I will you onwards and wish you back on the stage very, very soon indeed. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you to everybody for joining us for this Harrogate International Festival's summer weekend event. Lots more to come. Thank you, everyone. Stay well, stay safe. Thanks for joining us. If you have enjoyed this event as part of the Harrogate International Festivals, please do think about a donation to ensure that our festivals can survive in the future. Donations can be made by texting HIF and the amount to 70085. For more events, please visit our online hub, The HIF Player. It's packed with upcoming live streams, events you've missed, archive recordings and much more. <laughs>